Welcome to On Texas Football Post Game Show. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers, former Longhorn NFL player. Rod, heartbreaker in the Crescent City. Uh, I tell you what, uh, New Orleans was a was a, a, a nasty little lady tonight. The Longhorns came out, uh, had a chance to win it. Three throws to the end zone for Texas. Uh, none of them complete uh, from the 12-yard line. Uh, but maybe this game was lost sooner. But, you know, Texas had a chance there at the end, Rod. What did you think at the at the very end of that game? Could you believe the Longhorns were even in the – had a chance to, to score there at the end? Yeah, I don't know how – Washington screwed that up. Let's just be honest, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, Washington basically had the game in hand. I don't even know why they were necessarily running the football. That actually came back to haunt them because they were running the football and then Dylan Johnson got hurt. That injury timeout stopped the clock and they could have ran some more time off the clock. And then you had the snapper who ran into Jordan Whittington on the punt return and then, you know, that kick catch interference gave him another 15 yards. Jay Witt made another clutch play uh, basically on their best cover guy. And that was on Jabbar Muhammad down there late. So, yeah, I don't know how it ended up being as close as it was. The truth is it felt like, and I'm glad it ended up being close because I predicted it would come down to a game-winning drive. So uh, it came down to a game-winning drive. But the truth is it felt like Washington had control of the game for most of the game. Just watching it, it felt like it was Washington's game to lose. And as a Longhorn fan, that that made me uncomfortable. That I had an issue with that because I, I felt like the whole time, I was like, man, Washington's in control of this game. Even from the jump, even when it was still close in a tight game, it was tied at halftime, Washington felt like they had control of it. They, it, I didn't feel like Texas – it felt like Texas was scrapping to stay in the game the entire time, making scrappy plays because they they got great football character. And as Sark pointed out, they find different ways to win games and stay in games. But it, 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 both of these teams kind of, you know, they were true to character, right? Washington was led by their high-powered elite offense and their elite quarterback, <laughs> best quarterback Texas played. And see how that worked out. Texas played – the, the two best quarterbacks Texas play, they lost to him. Yep. That's how much the quarterback matters, right? It's just that quarterback's being that good. And I think so that they stayed true to that character. And I think for Texas, they stayed true to finding different ways, complementary football ways to stay in the game, whether it be on defense making a big play or whether it be offense making a big play here and there. But they did they weren't in control of the game. This Washington was in control of this game. Yep. Uh and, and and honestly, the truth is. Texas, not by – it wasn't a landslide. It wasn't totally lopsided. But Texas was outcoached and outplayed. Yeah, and I, I think well, they, they the certainly were thing. out-executed. Yeah. I, I think that – I mean, the, the number of penalties, pre-snap penalties, frankly, will tell you that. Um, I I have a hard time believe Texas even had a chance there to get back into the game. Uh, but you look at the total yards, Texas is almost at 500, 498 to Washington's 532. Uh, but what's more telling, in my opinion, uh, is just how dominant they were on the time of possession. 36 minutes compared to 23. Uh, we would not have thought that big a disparity going into this. Uh, but Washington seemingly moved the ball at will uh, for the second and third quarter. Uh, Washington dominated the third quarter, and that's where they kind of gave themselves some space to kind of hold on to it. At the very end, um, look, they are an extremely good football team. Uh, they deserve everything that's come to them. Texas had his chance at the end, uh, came up short. I don't know uh, that, uh, you know, you, you have three shots from the 12, four shots from the 12. You know, you got to you got to make a great throw and a great play because, you know, they're going to be snugged up in the right places there, Rod. Yeah. Uh, it was not. Uh, it was not easy by any stretch, uh, but the fact that Texas was there uh, means a lot. You look at this, you know, yards, Michael Penix, uh, 430 yards in the national semifinal. I mentioned to, uh, to Aaron, he started to remind me so much of Joe Burrow. It wasn't funny. His maneuverability and his sneaky athleticism combined with absolutely just deadly accuracy downfield. Um that's who he reminded me of. Uh, hmm. I don't know that he's Joe Burrow in, you know, long term or whatever. That's who he reminded me of, though, a lot. Um, 
anyways, yeah, uh, it's it's tough. I mean, tough to see uh, the Longhorns go this direction uh, after a tremendous season. Uh, this post game uh, brought to you by the folks at Yingling, uh, the next generation of light beer. Flight uh, is the name of it. Uh, Yingling is America's oldest brewery. Uh, we appreciate them and the Faust uh, Distributing Company and their sponsorship of the post game uh, this week. Hey, Rod. I mean, l- let's let's kind of try to break it down a little bit here. I want to get your just your. You said that they controlled the game. Was there anything Texas could do to stop a hot quarterback like that? Or did you just feel like Texas was almost helpless when a guy at one point was 21 of 24 on the night? Yeah, um, I, I think I tried to hint at it all, um, you know, basically all preview long and uh, the entire month uh, while we were getting ready and getting prepared for this game that, you know, they had a distinct advantage at quarterback and they had a real advantage when it comes to their sophisticated passing game, being the best passing game Texas has played because it was targeted at a weakness, a specific weakness of Texas was worse, their pass defense and the lack of coverage specialists. And I think where I miscalculated, I thought they would attack the Texas safeties more. They really didn't. They went after the corners and boy, did they ever, they cooked them. They went yeah. after him early and often, man, and they cooked those corners. They just went they, they it, there was nothing to if it and Texas really didn't have an answer because their corners just could not hold up in coverage, whether it be against the deep ball, um, whether it be when Penix was able to buy extra time. They asked they went with some really clever concepts. I mean, they had the targets to bunch formation, empty formation, but go look at how many times they would turn a corner, an outside corner for Texas, into a slot corner. It was brilliant. They would basically motion uh, a, a running back or a tight end outside of that number one receiver outside of that corner, basically turning him into a slot corner, giving him a two way go and changing your leverage instantly. And oftentimes kind of changing responsibility within the defense for that slot defender and changing where their help is coming from. It was a it was a brilliant adjustment. They did it a lot. They put Jay, they put uh, McMillan in the backfield. At time, a lot of times, actually, I think like three or four times we saw him catch balls out of the backfield where he motioned out of the backfield just to get him matched up on a safety or a linebacker. Formation in the boundary, one of the touchdowns was simply formation in the boundary. I've talked about formation in the boundary, how it isolates the Texas safeties. They did that. I mean, it, it, J- Kalen DeBoer was in, in uh, the offensive coordinator for Washington were in their bag against the Texas DBs. And when Penix is that hot, there's nothing they can do. Texas blitz, they came after him. It didn't work. The first touchdown, they threw, not the first touchdown, the big, uh, long 77-yard reception. That was Texas blitzed on that. It didn't really do any good. Uh, Ethan Burke came untouched one time on a touchdown pass. Untouched. Nobody touched him. And he still couldn't touch Michael Penix. He came up with nothing. I mean, that's – it's not – I'm not criticizing Texas here. I'm just talking about how good Michael Penix is at avoiding sacks. He's been like this his whole entire career. He's the best – quarterback in the country at sack avoidance and he showed it once again what are, that's what he reminds that's why it reminds me of joe burrow that and his accuracy on about 20 20 to 35 yard passes i mean he's uncharacteristically good yeah uh, in range i mean that that ball he put on roma dunzo uh for in the fourth quarter to set yes. him up what on what i mean dude <laughs> watch coverage that ball like if you he like basically hit the postage stamp. You know, he, <laughs> he didn't just hit the the target. I mean, he hit, he hit the top right of the postage. I mean, it was yeah phenomenal. I, I, man. Yeah, he had, he's one of those guys that's probably going to be a long term ten year NFL quarterback. Looks because, like it. You know, Moxie and and all of that stuff, and and I think that that's where it's where it's at right now. I, I've got so many notes here, Rod. I, I wrote down uh, notes during the game and. Uh, my my take on it, uh, as much as anything, is yours. Uh, Washington controlled the game in the third quarter. Texas fumbled twice. Uh, both Cedric Baxter and Jaden Blue fumbled tw- uh, each fumbled once, and it wasn't enough. All right, that that was just too much to overcome. Yeah, uh, Texas really didn't get any stops on defense until the fourth quarter, uh, when Washington already had a two score lead essentially. Um, and even then, they couldn't stop him from kicking a field goal on that one long drive in the fourth quarter as well. Uh, so you, you look at it all total, uh, Texas loses 37-31 uh, to the Huskies. 
but I mean, obviously, all is not lost for the Longhorns. I know that this season has been uh, a tough one uh, for the Longhorns to swallow a, a defeat like this after going 12 and one heading into this game. Now they're 12 and two. Uh, but look, uh, they showed the fight to the very end. Uh, Rod, I thought that was, uh, you know, admirable. I th- Another thing I thought was admirable is, you know, Quinn didn't really play well, in my opinion, but he still fought through it. Uh, Sark and the offensive line may not have played well in some respects, but they still fought through it. Uh, they they were able to get a – there were a couple of differences in this game. Their quarterback is, you know, should have probably won the Heisman in retrospect, in my opinion. Uh, his team's 14-0 and then the college football finals compared to Jaden Daniels who – it broke all kind of scoring records and TD records and all that stuff, but his team lost three games, right? Um, I, I take that as, as to heart. And then I also say Braylon Trice was a difference maker. Woo. Um, yeah. You know, he created that pressure on, on the third down play, had two mm. sacks during the game. I think he, he may have influenced a holding call at one point. Um, they, their on. top players made – top plays. Byron Murphy looked like he was going to make a, a great play at one point and put uh, put Washington in a third and long, but Michael Penix shook him, right? Now, Murphy and Sweat did combine for a fourth down stop in the first half, but my point being, Washington's big-time players, particularly Penix, Trice, and Adunze, made big plays on, on Monday night. I, yep. I feel like they made them. I'm not saying... Ewers and Mitchell and those guys didn't make great plays. It just felt like they were better than Texas. Those three guys made the difference. Dilla Johnson, a good player, but didn't make the difference, right? Yeah. Uh, that 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 kind of thing. Ultimately, the, the turnovers really costly for Texas as well. Yeah, the turnovers were the, the no doubt that was the biggest factor in the game, especially when those turnovers came for Texas. Um, I thought you know Texas had a chance to control more of the game. Um, I I, I thought Sark at one point got a little pass happy. Um, And I even said before the game, I thought Texas should throw and pass to open up the run. But after the first quarter, Texas is averaging more yards per rush than yards per attempt. And it was pretty clear that they could run the football on Washington. And Texas still threw the football, I think, way too often when they could have slowed down the game control the game, had some long sustained drive just from running the football, kept that Washington offense off the field, kept your defense from being exposed. Um, and I thought Sark's feel of the game was off. I think maybe in that moment, you know, he was pressing uh, a little bit too much. It, it's an, I, I, I thought I, I wanted to get Quinn in a groove and in a rhythm as well, but it was clear to start that game after the first quarter, that wasn't necessarily what was working. And I think for coaches, oftentimes winning the battle of adjustments is simplifying it to, all right, what's working for us? What's working, guys? What's working? What's working what ain't working? Let's do what's working, and then we can figure out the rest later. And he didn't do that. Even in the opening script, the pony package was in. It was in. So Sark was listening to some wise folks around him telling them, maybe ride B. Hey, man, use that pony package. It works. Even though last season you didn't use it at all versus Washington. And it was in the opening script. It was your first touchdown drive. The entire drive. Seven plays, 75 yards. Come on, man. You're averaging 10 yards per play out of the pony back. If you ran it two, two other plays the entire game and way too late in the game, you should have came back with that right after, probably within the next two drives, thinking to yourself, well, it, it, you know what? It's working real good. Play the hits. Control the game that way. You were running the football effectively. And I thought, that was a little bit of a miscalculation by Sark early on. He didn't run the football enough, and I think he could have went back to what was working and, and with that pony package, and it didn't. And that was just more to control the game. Uh, you were getting big plays out of it. Like I said, you averaged, I don't know, 10, nine and a half yards per play out of it throughout the entire game, um, and that's without my rewatch. I just off the top of my head. But the truth is you could have done that and controlled the game a little bit more and kept your defense off the field. It was also, also clear your defense, whatever PK was doing, just wasn't working. And you could not hold up in coverage versus them. And Michael Penix was on a heater. And that's feel of the game for a coach to realize, all right, 
They're too hot. We can't defend them. What's working for me is my running game. Actually, those two things sync up. Let's run the football, control the clock, slow it down, make it ugly. Make it ugly. We can win an ugly game, which you almost did. You, you played an ugly football game and you almost won it. Think about if you were just taking a few more possessions, a few more plays away from them by running the football. And I think you'd have been okay, but they didn't, you know, Sark, Sark, I think got a little too pass happy at times, but we're talking about a game of inches here. They still ended up potentially with a game winning drive at the end of the game. But I think that's the difference between you being in a championship right now, or one of the differences between you being in a championship and right now, Texas, you know, dealing with their second loss of the season. Yeah. Tough, tough loss in, in the sugar bowl tonight. Uh, Texas going down 37, 31. Uh, we said it was going to be in the thirties rod. Uh, you know, uh, we all, we all lined up. that direction. Uh, yeah. and sure enough, uh, it really was. I, I felt like Texas, uh, you know, did not play their best. No. Uh, and people are saying you're being too hard on Quinn Ewers. I'm, I'm not being too hard on Quinn Ewers. And I don't think Quinn Ewers is the reason why Texas lost tonight. I thought that was a team loss. Yeah. Uh, you, you fumbled the ball twice. Uh, you had, you know, had what, eight or nine penalties? Um, I oh, call 10. It. 10. Yeah. Uh, 10, 10 penalties. Um, there were a number of issues there. Add to the fact that, to Rod's point, the quarterback was on a heater and I, I think you add all of that together and you get a loss. And frankly, you were lucky to even be in the game and have a chance at the end zone four times. That's because true. I mean, all they had to do was just run the clock out. Uh, they had a 10 point lead, pretty comfortable one or a seven or six point lead, pretty comfortable one for most of the second half. Uh, so it, 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 excuse me, 10, most of the second half and then Texas ended up coming back there. But, uh, look, I, I feel like Texas lost the game fair and square. If you want to, you know, there was no – I don't think the that the penalties were the reason and that the rest were out to get Texas or any of that stuff. I think Michael Penix played a great game. Mm -hmm. uh, the Longhorns did not play their best game. Uh, I thought the defense uh, for Texas left a lot to be desired. Uh, frankly, 520 yards, uh, 36 minutes of time of possession – not not great. It was an improvement over the last over last year. Look at Washington was three of eleven on third down. Yeah. If you would have told me that Washington going into this game was going to be three of eleven on for, on third down, I would have said Texas wins. What would you have said? Three of eleven on third downs. Yeah, I would have asked how many deep balls they completed. <laughs> And remember last year, they were one, Washington was one of 10 on D balls, but they were 56% conversion rate on third and fourth down. Yeah. This year, they flipped it. They said, all right, we'll give you the money downs. You win that because you're an elite money down defense. But we'll take the deep balls. And they took them. They, that, those, that's, I, I, I lost count. And like, I think they threw like, they had five, five of them that I counted. And I believe at that time, they were like four or five. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm done. <laughs> I was trying yeah. to track the Texas defended the D bar really well. They didn't. Um, and that I think is why ultimately defensively, you go look at hell. I want to say you go look at his 430 yards at, at halftime. I think he had 255 or something like that, somewhere around there. And most of that was off of like three completions yep. that he had made on deep balls. You know, that's, that's what a Texas secondary just couldn't hold up. If they would defended the deep ball a little bit better, I think they'd have, uh, they'd at least been able to force them to be behind the chains a little bit more. I don't know if it would have mattered though. The truth is when you got a quarterback that's on guys, when your quarterback is on like that, it, at times, sometimes it just don't matter. It don't matter what the opposing team is doing when a dude is that hot and y'all witnessed it. We, I don't even know if we've seen him play a better game this year. I don't, I don't know if he played that good versus Oregon. I, I really don't I, don't. I don't look at the stats. Bobby, His he's... first three quarters were <laughs> impeccable. <laughs> no, he was – that's what I – I mean, Joe Burrow is tr a tremendous pick-you-apart quarterback. Michael Penix was a pick-you-apart quarterback. He yeah. had a, he had an answer or a solution yep. to every problem you threw at him, Period. whether it was short, quick ball to the back, uh, a dig route yeah. somewhere to yeah. the outside. He had an answer, and uh, that's, that's, that's just the way it goes. Uh, football can be won by players on both sides of the ball. Uh, Michael Dutton, thank you for this. Uh, can we be thankful? I love my team, my coach, my program. They were better, and Rod was right. Ha-ha, need to run more. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, 
Texas averaged 6.4 yards uh, <laughs> per carry and lost the game. <laughs> but, and but, I mean, that's at one possession. Point, at going into halftime, though, Rod, Michael Penix was averaging 17.7 yards per attempt <laughs> at throwing. So how do you keep up with that? I mean, run the ball I mean, and shoot them off the field. Yeah, you run the ball and you keep them off the field, have them on the bench watching you run the ball out of pony package with two backs like you did. I don't understand how you over he, – he overcomplicated it, guys. You guys know he did. He he got a little too cute. It's okay. It's okay. It doesn't mean he's not a good coach. It just means he's not perfect. He ain't Jesus Christ. All right? he, 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 he got out coached in that game because he should have just simplified it. And football is a simple game, complicated at times by simple men. And we get simple at times. He should just run the football. That keeps them on the bench, and it just keeps you run. It keeps them, all right? It keeps that defense having to they, – they would have to allocate resource to stop the run game. When they do, then you'll get your favorable matchups on the outside and you can throw the football. It, it, it became obvious to everybody in the stadium that Texas could run the football. And he didn't want to run it. He didn't want to run it. He didn't. He decided, now nah, I'm good. And then by the time you decided you wanted to run it, it was too late. It was too late. Then they had already got double digits. Now you're in a different type of game. You got you to gotta feel that at the time. You got to feel that as a coach at the time. Like, oh, my game play initially, that was a miscalculation. We're not going to throw the ball. We're going to run it down their throats because we can do that. And he didn't. He didn't. He, he hesitated on that. And I think the hesitation, it cost him. It cost him. Yeah, I don't think he was expecting necessarily to get uh, that much, right? Uh, hey, this one's from KD35. I'm the best. I thought the refs were a joke Saturday night for that Dallas game, but this crew tonight was a disgrace to college football. Block of the back, not called, no holding on Washington all, OL all night. Look, I, they did some good stuff. I, I Even when the, – the, the reality of it is, even when Texas got pressure, Penix evaded the pressure. Yeah, he did. I mean, he just is a he just did a great job. There's nothing we can do, but you nothing we can do as far as a lot of those penalties. I thought a lot of them were obvious against Texas. So the holding against Christian Jones, I mean, he was tearing his jersey. That's pre a hold. Yeah, I, I yeah, pre-snap penalties are are legitimate. You can't really do anything. Baron Sorrell jumped off sides to start the game, right? And there are things like that that you can't even, you know, debate. Yep. So I wasn't I wasn't overwhelmed by that. Uh, all right, this one from uh, Kevin Jones. Reminder, folks, I'm glad we got as far as we did after some of the games we had in regular season. I'm happy we got as far as we did. I think everybody is in the, of the same uh, opinion there, uh, 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 Kevin. My thought, though, is that what could have been based yeah. on what we just saw, what could have been because Washington almost tried to give Texas – a chance to win that football game. They didn't um, give them a chance to win that football. Game. Yeah, they did. I couldn't believe it when they they called procedure on Washington. I mean, that was amazing. That gave Texas fifty <laughs> seconds with the ball or forty five seconds with the ball. It was yeah. Like they were supposed to have like ten from their own ten, you know. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, I, I think that's where it's at. Um, I will agree with this, Rob. What do you think from Drew? I feel like the month layoff hurt us. Where was Sweat? I, let's. I don't know that sweat being laid off was was the issue. I think the the month off hurt the hurt the offense more yep. than it did the defense. You said it, Bobby. So I'm blaming you. We were doing the pregame, and you asked. It was the first question you asked when we did the pregame. You said you think the month off is gonna hurt Texas or Washington more, and then you uh, you know kind of pre prefaced the question by saying I think it's gonna hurt Texas more and hurt Quinn more coming off the best game he's ever had. And damn it, damn you, Bobby. Damn you. Because I think you're right. He started off shaky. He did. He started off. He had the jitters early on. He just was erratic. They started, they ran RPOs early on, which was, that's 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 Quinn's forte, right? That's yep. his wheelhouse. And they ran RPOs early on because Washington is terrible at defending RPOs. One of the things Washington was really coached well to do was, hey, I don't know how many batted passes they had, but they knew. When you don't get there, quick game, get your hands up. 
All right. If you don't get home, get your hands up. They had like, I, I think at least four batted passes, four or five that I remember. And they were like early on too, on some of those RPO throws. Texas wanted to run RPO game early and they had very little success, especially passing the game out of the RPOs. And I thought that would have been Quinn's comfort zone. I think that was starting trying to get him in a rhythm. And you're right, uh, Bobby. He just, that time off, it, he did not look like he was confident. He didn't look like he was in the groove. What's up, CJ? How you doing, brother? <laughs> you CJ, doing, you were there in the stands, my man. Uh, what was the what was the atmosphere like? What were you thinking this uh, tonight? And uh, what what was the last minute of the game like for for Texas? There, man. What a what a crazy ending. That was one of the best football games I've watched in person in my life. That was that was a game. That was a hell of a game. And it's a unfortunate Texas fell short, but man. What a game that was. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate, obviously, but I have to sit there and think about the opportunities that Texas was given and the opportunities that Texas didn't take advantage of. That was a game Washington probably should have won by about 20. I thought in that first half, there was no reason for that game to have been tied. There's no reason for Texas to have been in that game. They were outplayed. They were outcoached. The physicalness was not there. The offense in it of itself was a shell. If you take away the muffed punt, I mean, that, that team, I, I, I didn't think that they came into play right away. It, mm-hmm. it just wasn't a good showing. It, it, it was bad. It was, a, it was one of the worst executed defensive uh, game plans that I've seen under Pete Kwiatkowski. And I, 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 like I said earlier at the, at the live show, I was, I'm one of his biggest fans. I love what he is able to do coming into games, to start early in games. There was nothing. There was no adjustments. Texas, I, Michael Penix had a clean jersey the entire the entire night. He wasn't touched at all. Uh, it just seemingly was so easy for Washington to go up and down the field, and ultimately that's what you know ended up costing Texas. Yeah, I I, I think you're about, you're right on. Uh, first of all, uh, second of all, uh, my my thought process here on almost all of this is that Texas uh, did not play its best game defensively. That's for sure. Um, they ended up with 500 plus yards of offense. Washington did, uh, but Texas did hold them to three of 11 in, on third down. And I, I will say this: they stepped up and made a, a fourth down stop when they absolutely had to have it. They made Washington kick field goals twice when they absolutely needed Washington kick, kick field goal field goals. It they they did okay with the bend but don't break, mm-hmm. right? But they were bend but don't break after Washington got up. They were breaking early. The first three trips to the red zone were all touchdowns, right? And so, or actually first four. So my point being, that allowed them to kind of control the game and control the clock and not allow the Texas offense then to to get back to the run game, Rod, frankly, Mm -hmm. uh, is is what you're talking about here. And so I I felt like that was part of it. Um, Got a couple of other things. CJ, I want to ask you what what you thought about the end of the, that ending sequence uh, of the 45 seconds left on the on the clock when Texas got the ball back, that that had to be freaking out Texas fans because everybody was trying to figure out well, they're going to have 15 seconds left, 20. I know Rod was doing the math. I, I was doing the math. We were all mm-hmm. doing the math. Yep. They're going to have 10 seconds or 15 seconds from their own 20, but they ended up from their own 30 with 45 seconds. What what were people talking in, about in the stands and? Uh, what not, CJ, when you saw that? Yeah, funny enough, I was actually right in the heart of the Washington section. So <laughs> there was a lot more confusion, a lot of a lot of screaming about why Dylan Johnson wasn't able to get off the field, which you think he if, – if he was able to, he, he would have. Yeah, yeah, you know? no doubt, no doubt. The, the kid was hurt. <laughs> he went I off mean, in a cart. Let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's be clear, Washington I fans. mean, my goodness um, – the the fair catch I don't I don't think it ever was really in in doubt for Washington the, the fans that I was sitting around in the Washington section I don't think there was ever any tense moments until the fair catch interference which you know propelled Texas up to the thirty yard line with forty five seconds left the deep ball to Jordan uh, Whittington was one a thing of beauty and two yeah. a hell of a catch but that was really you know the the first sign of oh this might actually be a thing you know that <laughs> this might be one of the greatest drives in college football history. And unfortunately for Texas, they came up just a bit short. 70, was it, they had to go 70 yards, 69 yards, whatever. 
uh, with 45 seconds and then come up 12 yards short. I don't know if y'all have talked about it, but that first play that Sarkeesian had uh, once Texas got down to the 12, I didn't like it. I understand the idea of trying to get four or five yards while maintaining enough time on the clock to get two plays, maybe a third if you need to. You only have so much time. Every second is so valuable. Get a shot into the end zone. I didn't like it at all. It, yeah. it but, but, man, like I said, what a game. I don't that's know. A, that's I don't a know. It's, it's interesting. It, I I felt like the back shoulder was available. Uh, it was. I wrote that in the chat. And the chat, the back shoulder was available on, on the goal line. Uh, if if AD would have just been able to turn around. The other thing that w- I would say is that play didn't allow you to set up anything to later to a- add nine Mitchell. But if you would have thrown that same pass on thir- on first or second down, you would have realized how the DBs were playing you. Yeah. Third or fourth down. Great point. Also, A.D. Mitchell's first target came with 624 left in the third quarter. Well, his first real target. I, look, I know I know that there's going to be advanced stats. He threw a couple away early that were designed for Adonai Mitchell, to be fair. Like, yeah. I, I think that I, – I wish they would have used him more. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that, especially with the Xavier Worthy. So let, let's clear the air a little bit about Xavier Worthy and his ankle, et cetera. Yeah. It's – it is bothersome. We could talk about how much we want to say this, but he's not moving as well laterally. He's favoring it. He's been favoring it. He re-aggravated it this week at one point. Uh, CJ, you and I knew about the Keelan Robinson injury. We uh, went mum on injuries starting on, I guess, Thursday afternoon or Friday morning uh, because of all of the uh, stuff that we were he- hearing. Uh, he clearly couldn't be part of the pony package, Rob, a uh, uh, Rod. You know what I mean? And so that was a piece of it. Um, all of those factors uh, played a role. CJ, uh, what did you think? You, you mentioned P- PK and Rod. You you mentioned as well the defensive e- execution. Rod, is there anything on defense you would have liked to seen from PK different? Or is Kellen DeBoer in this Michael Penix-led offense just that good right now? Like, who's that's a great, That's a great question. Stop him? I mean um, – yeah, I mean, honestly, I saw a lot of everything. I saw bump and run coverage. I saw them blitzing interior. I saw them coming off the edge. I saw them bringing the safeties from the second level. The truth is, uh, and it's its own coach. It's on the coaches, right? PK just did not have an answer. He They, they presented the Texas defense with se- several problems to solve, and they could not solve any of them uh, throughout the night, specifically the deep ball. Now, on money downs, as – uh, Bobby mentioned Texas did pretty good on money downs, but I don't necessarily think that that mattered in the end because Pennis was so successful moving the football uh, down the field on the vertical shots down the field. Like I said, I, I'm sure CJ may have a better answer. I, have, I won't go back and track track the game the night before the morning show I got in about, I don't know, a few hours. <laughs> All right. Um, and go see how many deep shots. But I mean, I lost track when they were like close to four or five or four or six on deep shots down the field. Uh, Texas couldn't stop the deep shots. And I was wrong about them attacking the safeties. I would have attacked the safeties. They didn't need to. They attacked the corners. They came out to the corners. I mean, Ryan Watts, Terrence Brooks, Malik Muhammad. I mean, everybody had their moment where Kalen DeBoer and Pete Michael Pennings decided to serve them up on a platter. And it just, it happened that way. And it, like I said, it, the corners, like I said, the corners are your strengths in coverage right now. <laughs> Do you think they did that because they can get to them quicker and they have more one-on-ones and less likely to have turnovers if there's a pass rush concern? No, I mean, they they, they went after – I mean, they went after Jade Barron. Hell, that tight end was cooking Jade Barron. I, I mean, it's it, – like I said, it, I, I, it, I don't know if there's anything that, honestly, PK could have done. Like I said, Jade Barron was out there giving up plays – to the tight end, the corners are best coverage safeties, whether you're looking at scores or when you're looking at uh, just overall reps and snaps, eye tests, they were getting beat. That's what happens when you got three in it. But it doesn't happen. You don't see three NFL wide receivers on the team. You just don't see it. Along with an NFL quarterback in Michael Penix, who now people believe might be the best damn quarterback in the country <laughs> after watching him versus Texas. Everybody's like, actually, I want to rethink that Heisman vote I had. I'm not sure. I think. I may pick that guy. That guy looks really, really good. I mean, 
I, I just don't think Texas was prepared for him to play one of his best games, if not his best game. They assumed, oh, man, he, you know, he's he hasn't actually been playing his best football at the end of the season. He's played at the beginning of the season. I think they were just shell-shocked to watch Michael Penix in a zone. And I, like I said, he cooked your best coverage defenders. I don't know what anything you could have done. Derek Williams getting in there didn't matter at all because they weren't targeting the safeties. Didn't matter. I think there's a couple things real quick, Bobby about the secondary and I think it's more encouraging about what's to come because all kind of month leading up to this game we've talked about the speed in the secondary not necessarily being there and we've talked about it specifically at the safety spot but Rod you you hit it right on the head Washington looked at Ryan Watts like someone that they knew that they could go target they knew that they could get after him right away that was exactly where they went whenever they needed a big shot and I, I can't blame them. The speed just isn't necessarily there for Texas to main, you know, con- consistently be in a position to, you know, affect passes. There was always there's three or four balls where I thought Texas was just a step short. Uh, the Ryan Watts ball or the the Roma Dunze ball right over Ryan Watts' shoulder where he didn't look like he had a hand in the pocket. Perfect throw, perfect catch. Showed late hands on the on the reception. Uh, there was only two passes that I thought Texas got hands on defensive backs it was michael taffy coming down the field on a, on a quick you know Good underneath play. route yep. or out route and then it was the the touchdown that ended up you know fortuitously bouncing right Mom. in the hands of a washington receiver those were the only passes that texas was really in a possession position in to make a play on the ball and i think that alone is something that will change with the current you know, 2024, 2023 class, you talk about the speed of Malik Muhammad, you start getting these guys a little bit more acclimated to the game and older, that speed will change. I think Texas is just a tad slow today. And then obviously you talked about the big plays. Washington had them, Texas didn't to start the game. And it was a little bit unlucky. Obviously the deep ball to Xavier Worthy is one that really stands out where he had a step. It was a good ball. It just didn't, he just couldn't see it. I guess he didn't see it initially on the ascent uh, from Quinn Ewers' hand. That, I mean, Bobby, you, you talked about the speed in the ankle, but he created enough separation there that if that ball is caught in stride, he's scoring six points. That's something I look at. Jaden Blue dropped a, a big pass as yeah. well. Yeah. There were moments where Texas took the deep shot and it just, for whatever reason, couldn't land. And that certainly hindered their ability to move the ball in the first half. It stalled drives. And meanwhile, Washington on the other side, it, every time they went deep, it was there. It was that you know the tail of the the two halves there, right there for the deep passing, and you know Texas, for their to their credit, when they needed to answer, they did, and it seemingly always felt like they would get to where they needed to be, and Washington would take another step up. It just couldn't you know get over that hump, and ultimately it bit them in the rear. I, I want to say this: that they the other thing I would add is Texas started the second half so slow. Uh, Washington marched it down the field, a four and a half minute drive, scored to go up 28 21. Texas gets the ball back. Cedric Baxter fumbles on the first first handoff. Uh, Washington then kicks a field goal. The defense had a sudden change. Uh, good defense there, stopped them to just a field goal. Then Texas came back out, and I believe it was either a three and out or a four and out uh, for Texas at, at that point. Washington then gets the ball back. Uh, Texas then gets the ball back again, and Jaden Blue fumbles. By this time, we're in the fourth. We're in the fourth quarter already, because Washington was being so effective in time uh, with time and time consuming with the ball. Uh, it was really. It, I, I felt like the second half just started. I, I felt like they lost the game at the start of the second half. Mm-hmm. That third quarter, they just they tur- had two turnover or one and a half turn. I, the, the blue fumble was at the beginning of the fourth quarter, but my point being, you had a turnover, you have one turnover in the third quarter, you had a three and out. Meanwhile, the other team marched up and down the field on you, and you didn't really have much to say. Bobby, I will. Bobby, Bobby, they had <laughs> to your point, just to add to it, just not to interrupt you. Texas ran five plays in the third quarter. Yep. I'm serious. No, I know. I that that makes total sense. <laughs> I mean, that's where I was getting at. That makes no, sense. Was, to your point. Like, like that's where they lost the game. Like they were non-existent. They didn't put up a fight. There was no offense, literally, in the third quarter. None at all. Yep. Yeah. It, it it's 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 tough. Uh, the other the other thing I would say the the one thing that did seem to affect Penix 
was pressure up the middle. Um, he got flushed on that in the, the fourth quarter a little bit, and it did seem to affect him. Uh, so I think that if I had to say one thing I would ask PK to do more frequently is to rush from the middle and push pressure up, up the middle. Uh, is that going to be perfect? No, of course not. That's not the panacea to stop Washington's offense, but it's something that Texas, I think, could have done a little bit a, a little bit better. All right, we got some questions and stuff we want to get to. Uh, toe sucker, loss hurts, but I am grateful for the best season in 10 years. How about 14? The future is bright uh, with this team. Something I could not say for a decade. I completely agree with you. Uh, Jeff, uh, the game felt like death by a thousand cuts. God, I believe I agree with that. Especially that third quarter was so difficult to watch. But somehow we were there at the final second. What a season, though. I'll always remember this team. And you should. Uh, because, frankly, Texas had a chance to pull this one out. Uh, mm. But, uh, you know, it, it, it happens. Uh, Texas trying to get that done. Sergeant Pickles has been a guy that's been here uh, with us a lot uh, on the live streams. He's a Washington fan. Not here to gloat. You guys have been great. Darn good game and a guard, a darn good team you guys have. From me to you, hook them horns and go dogs. Uh, they will take on, obviously, Michigan in the national yeah. championship game next week in Houston. Uh, Daniel Clark wants to know what happens if Blue doesn't fumble. Oh, I, I, I you know, I don't know, and I'll say this. Washington probably calls a different set of plays instead of going big game hunting and run, running uh, some trick plays in that next possession, right? Because Washington tried to, to juice it up a little bit and run some trick plays the very next possession. I, I think Kellen DeBoer got a little bit ahead of himself on that one. Um, I, uh, I, Rod and, and, and CJ, I want to ask you a couple more questions before we get going to, to others uh, in the chat. Uh, do you, who do you think had the best game for Texas tonight? I thought like, Ethan Burke was tremendous. You thought Ethan Burke was tremendous? I thought he was very impactful. There's a drive specifically, I think, in the first quarter where he made two plays on the edge. He did. Made Texas two forced a three and out right after. Uh, there was a number of plays, you know, that I thought he was impactful on around the line of scrimmage. Texas only had, I think, two tackles for loss. So it's not like there was a lot of pressure, you know, behind the line, but – he was a guy that I consistently noticed on the defense that was making plays. There weren't many to look at on that defensive side of the ball, but he was one um, player of the game. I don't know. Yeah. I think that's the problem. I don't know. I think that's the problem, guys. That's why they – like literally, I think that in a nutshell is why they lost the game. You can't think of a – we can't think of a player of the game. We know this team better than anybody else. We know him intimately. And looking at this team and watching that entire four-quarter game now, came down to the wire like, who was the player of the game? Uh, not sure. And you're right because I'm not sure anybody stepped up and was exceptional in that game. I'm not sure anybody was extraordinary in that game. Now, the good news is you still had a chance to win. You still had a chance because you had good football character and because you have a good football culture. But who the hell stepped up in that moment? To be the guy, the dude, the dog. Hell, watching that like three or four of them. Penix was that guy. Trice was that guy. Oh, Doomsday stepped up. But Millie, but they had a bunch of them. Who Trice, was the dude man. for Texas? Yeah. Exactly. Tough, it, it's tough when you think about it, Rod, uh, because uh, you also got to think about Jonathan Brooks. I mean, what would would he have been a difference maker in this game? Do you in in your your uh, thought process as it relates to the run game, maybe Sark maybe goes to him a little bit more than he goes to Baxter or Blue. Maybe could be, could be. Especially yeah. after those two that's guys fumble. That could be yeah, the case. That's, that's but I, I mean, think, that, I think um, that's, that's, the guys played well. They played. It's a 31-37 game. Guys came down to a, a last possession. So I'm not going to insult the way they played. But my point is. It's a, at this point, we're talking about championship, right? Championship yep. caliber uh, performance and what separates them. Guys, that's why Washington is advancing and Texas is not because they had like four five players. We would have to debate who's the player of the game. It'd be Penix, like, man, Brandon Trice had a great game. What about the receivers for Texas? We don't know because not enough guys stepped up in that role. We just don't know. Their, fir their first round picks showed out. Yep. Y'all agree with that? We talked Amen, about how. They had three guys that were likely first rounders, Penix, Adunze, uh, and uh, Braylon Trice, and they showed out like they were first rounders. 
Y'all agree? Yeah. Y'all, CJ, agree. you agree with that as well? Yeah. I mean, Rogers mentioned it. Trice was impactful in the behind the line of scrimmage. Roma Madunze was incredible. Michael Penix put together what I would consider one of the best quarterback performances of the, the entire season. On the big stage, I think he started 18 of 21, 18 of 22. 21 uh, of 24 at one time, CJ. I mean, he was <laughs> – if there was a ball that needed to be put in a certain spot, he was doing it, and he did it the entire game. That was, like I said, one of the best quarterback performances on a, on a big stage, no less, that I've seen in this entire season. So credit to him. Uh, I would say – I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of at a loss. I just lost what I, where I was headed, but yeah. <laughs> no. no it I happens didn't. to us all sometimes, CJ. It yeah. happens to us all. That, hey, uh, guys, we're, we're looking at all this and thinking about uh, the Longhorns. They had a great, they had a great season. I mean, let's, let's call it what it is. Um, it doesn't mean we can't be upset or are wishing uh, that they would have done better tonight, uh, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's what I would tell people right now just just because you're upset about one loss don't take it to be the the bad because if you look back at where texas has come in the last three years that has to be the focal point of what you think texas is going to be in the future because that's where this program is headed i it it just is they've got the quarterbacks uh, they've got the the athletes that i think are coming in that are already on campus that are going to be better and better they may not be as good next year okay but i'm telling you they're coming right now a little bit i texas, agree texas on I agree that. but i will say this about national championship runs championship runs they are rare yes yep um uh, winning conference championships if a national championship runs are rare i i, ta- I talked to an oklahoma sooner uh player who's a, a good friend of mine i hate to admit and <laughs> And he said, man, don't ever forget after Bob Stoops won his first national title, uh, his only national title in his second year, everybody said, it's just the first of many. It's coming, baby. They coming. Lots of them. And he never get, they never won another one. And mm-hmm. I was like, they, 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 it's like, man, he is a, he's one of the greatest coaches of all time. It never happened. It, it's just, it don't happen a lot to make those runs to get there. The coach has got to be right. Timing, injury, luck, all those things. And, you know, I'm not saying Texas won't get back there, but these runs are rare. So to Bobby's point, less acknowledging, you know, uh, admire what the team has done, because if they get on a run where they can do it multiple times, that'd be great. But, you know, it's it's rare for you to have a great team. And this is a great team. They're a great team. They, sh- they I knew it was going to come down to the game winning drive. I just hope they would have been Texas. Uh, getting a game-winning drive scenario, uh, fortunately, was you know, unfortunately, it was Washington uh, defense stepping up in a big moment. You know what was almost the biggest moment of that game for Texas, and it was actually something that Washington did. It was around the 11-minute mark in that fourth quarter. Washington gets the ball up two scores, and DeBoer, I think, out of five plays, four of them were incompletions. I think they only took off about 45 seconds of clock, up two scores. And allowed Texas, who had just fumbled after – I think it was right after the Jaden Blue fumble. Yep. Uh, that was the the door creaking open for Texas right there. I was sitting there, you know, I think I was the only Washington fan that was kind of – or Washington, you know, in that Washington area, sorry, that was sitting there, you know, kind of wondering what, what was that sequence from Washington because it mm-hmm. didn't take off any time after they had just gone the entire third quarter with the ball in their possession seamlessly, you know, you know, not having any resistance against them. So that was, you talk about a lot of what ifs, if Texas won that game, that was the moment that was going to allow them to get back in. And so I, it's a, great I, I point. A, a, a bullet dodged. No, CJ, you're right. 1239 left right after Texas fumbled the football. Um, and that was what, that was that, uh, I believe it was, yes, that fumble after Jaden Blue fumbled. They get the ball back, and they go incompletion on first down to Romo Dunze. There's a pass interference call. Remember that pass interference on Terrence Brooks? Uh, but then they go incompletion again, and then another incompletion on second down, and then a pass complete for zero yards on third down, and then they put – so he was essentially he went five straight passes and while they were up 34 to 21 with 12 minutes, end up being 11 minutes left. So you're right. If, it, if they lose that game, everybody's going to question Kalen DeBoer's 
time management, game management in that moment. Because they were that was poor. They probably should have been running the football there. And then Texas never ends up with enough time left to have a game winning drive scenario. All right. We got some more questions here uh, or in comments. And I, I want to take the good with the bad here, guys. Uh, we didn't look prepared for this one tonight from Jonathan Hanley. I, I can agree with a little bit of that. I mean, there, there's some element there that Texas did not play its best game. Uh, that's what Rod and I talked about earlier. Uh, it's not that they didn't look prepared. They just didn't execute well. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily about preparation. That's about timing and rhythm. That sometimes after a three- or four-week layoff, it hurts. It, it gets to you, and that really seemed to play a role in, in that, especially early for Texas. Uh, for Michael Dutton, at least run it every time on first down when you're averaging <laughs> 6.4 yards per carry like Texas is. Uh, maybe so, Michael, but – I don't think you can do it every time on first down. Uh, J.S. Hooper, horns were fumbling left and right. Running wasn't the easy answer. How do Murphy and Sweat not earn any holding penalties all season? See, Jay, I'm going to go to you. What did you think about the uh, the uh, uh, referee situation in game uh, when you were there? Any Anything that you thought or saw that was egregious that maybe we didn't catch uh, on TV? I don't think there was anything – egregious enough for me to say that was a massive momentum switch. I might be missing something. Yep. Uh, a lot of Texas's penalties were self-inflicted pre-snap. You know, th- it's been an issue the entire season long. Uh, I, I don't think what Texas showed penalty wise was out of character for them because when you talk about a false start, a snap infraction and offsides, this is all something that we've seen, you know, kind of rear its ugly head throughout the entire season. I would say I, I didn't get a good look on the Christian Jones holding. Uh, I, maybe y'all can talk a little bit more to that. That negated a big play. Did he, was it? Yeah, it was, it was a big, it was a big hold. Okay. I mean, he just, he, he basically had the Jersey inside. I mean, he basically was pulling the inside of the Jersey around the guy's shoulder pad. <laughs> so it was, it was definitely a hold. Got it, it was definitely a hold, but I agree. It did negate a, 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 a big play, and it was more to the point, though. They're talking about both Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy not getting any holding penalties. Yeah, all, that's crazy. All season. That's yeah. that's the bigger that's the bigger issue that I would yeah. agree with people on. I don't I don't know how that's a thing. You have the Outland Award winner, and you have another guy who's getting day two mock drafts left and right. For them to to go an entire season without a hold is, I mean, yep. Opposing offensive linemen must have been on their A game, you know. <laughs> Rod, this is for you. This one's for you. Fitting our season ended on bad red zone offense. Ooh. Yeah. That's a cut. That's a cut. Yeah, it just seems like that Oklahoma State game, I, I referred to it several times, hoping it was a trend when they went five of five, scoring touchdowns in the red zone, 35 points scored in the red zone, no red zone field goals versus Oklahoma State in the Big 12 title game. Um, it seems like that was the outlier. Um, and that Texas kind of regressed back to the mean in this matchup. But that, like I said, that, that means that they were just flawed. Uh, it wasn't a tragic flaw for them. They still made it to the college football playoff in spite of being a, you know, a bad red zone offense, actually, for most of the season. And we just don't know why they were a bad red zone offense because it doesn't make sense football wise because they have so many great weapons. They got NFL wide receivers, got NFL tight end. And for most of the year, you had a, a Doak Walker Award finalist in the backfield, and you got the biggest offensive line in the conference, one of the biggest in the country. Just doesn't make sense as to why they're bad, and, they're, and a great play caller too. And they're still were bad in the red zone um, in money time. Uh, so that's weird. I don't know if Sark ever really figured it out. It'll be interesting to ask him. Not in this post game, but once he cools off, watches film, self scouts to figure out did he figure out what was going on. Uh, did he actually solve the red zone issues or is he just going to move on and say, you know, we're moving on to the next one because I would love to know what he thought their biggest problem was in the red zone. Cause I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I think that they never got the passing game really going in the red zone, the, the tight window passing game. And mm-hmm. that problem may have came home to roost tonight. Yeah. I, I mean, like they, they, they never really got that tight passing game going. Uh, and I don't and maybe they didn't want to do it because uh, Quinn had some issues against like OU, for example, uh, where he had that one. Uh, 
but uh, a lot of that uh, talk, uh, you know, we can figure that out as as the year goes on or yeah. as the offseason goes on. Uh, Kevin Jones, why didn't we run at least ne- at, at the end near the goal line, then kick the in- extra point? Like Rod said, running it was successful, and at the end, running it would have been better. Mm-hmm. I think hindsight's 20, 20, 20 but – I mean, if they run the ball, they may not get any, yeah, any uh, additional plays, Rod. Yeah, time, time, yeah, because of time restraints, it's tough at the end of the game. I said, I think Sarge just waited too late to try to run it. The time to run it was really after the first quarter. Um, because what you wanted to do, if Sark would have ran the ball successfully a little bit more throughout the game, what you're, t- you're trying to do is play complimentary football, the thing he, the term he throws out all the time, and keep the Washington offense. Uh, off the field, so limit maybe them with to one or two fewer possessions or fewer plays, and they dominated time of possession. You averaged over six yards per rush, and yet they do- dominated time of possession. That that's usually not the case. <laughs> um, and I think Sark missed an opportunity when he was averaging fewer yards per attempt uh, than yards per rush. <laughs> uh, when he was it was right after the first quarter because I was on doing the in game live watch with Ian. I said, man. If you're averaging six yards per rush and you're averaging five something yards per pass per attempt, man, you should just run the football. And your defense is getting cooked because the quarterback is just on a heater and your your defensive coordinator has got his hands up. I can't solve it. And by the way, I got no better ideas either. Just run the damn football, slow the game down and keep their offense off the field. Make it ugly. Who cares? And who cares if you even score off of those tries if you're just playing keep away until you can solve the problem. And I don't think they did that based on the numbers. So I kind of, he kept with his, I think he, I think he stayed on the script, but I, that might've been a bad decision. You probably should have went off the script and started to just run the football. Cause it was, uh, you're getting chunk yards in the running game. Every time you handed off the ball and every time you tried to throw the football, you were getting behind the chains. Uh, Quinn was off, uh, you know, ball placement was off, was inaccurate. It just wasn't working. It was an old DKR quote, right? When when you throw the ball, three things can happen, and two of them are bad. That was happening to Texas in that game, and we saw this happen with Texas even a couple of years ago. Remember the Baylor game a couple of years ago when Quinn was just off; it just wasn't working. Couldn't throw the football every time you throw it, he fumbled or throw a pick, just wasn't working, and he just ran the football over and over again. Now you had Bijan and Rojo on the backfield, but I know it's in Sark's mind to understand that when the run game is working, you can just simplify things and and force your opponent to stop the run game. And when they, they do that, they'll do that by loading the box, and that'll open up a lot of other things in the passing game. And Texas didn't do that. And they didn't play the hits. The hits were the pony package. It was in the script. I know you know it works because it was in your script, and it was the first touchdown drive you had. You ran the pony package every play, average 10 yards per play. Why didn't you go back to it? And why did you go back to it if only two plays late in the game? I don't understand that. I don't get it. You could have ran the football out of it, controlled the game. I don't get it. I don't know. All right, we're going to get some more comments and questions uh, from the audience. Uh, talk a little bit more about the 37-31 loss to the Washington the Huskies. The Huskies on to the college football championship game uh, against the Michigan Wolverines, who survived in overtime against uh, Alabama. Uh, and for people that were questioning Sark's play calling near the goal, goal line, uh, there's going to be a whole other issue with calling a quarterback dive on fourth and two in overtime in the college football semifinal. So I just want to, if you haven't seen that play because you were either at the game or not watching it because you were uh, predisposed, uh, Alabama's play call on the goal line was just so questionable. I don't even know what to say. At least Texas and Sark had to, had to deal with the time constraints uh, that they were concer- concerned about. All right, uh, Edmund Lee with the nice super chat here. What a season, exciting to the end. Thanks to the OTF team for an awesome program. Thank you, Edmund, for watching everybody as well. Hot, Pen- Penix was hot as fire. Recruiting focus now. Keep moving forward. Hook them horns. Flight beers tonight. That's right. Uh, we're sponsored by <laughs> Flight, uh, the, the nice. uh, next generation of light beer from Yingling. We also appreciate them as well as uh, the folks at Faust Distributing. Some other questions. Uh, Peter DeGrape, this team has us back as a premier program in the nation. It's been a while. DB's coming in. Early this spring semester, we'll fix our cover issues. CJ, we need to set proper expectations. Rod, you need to do this too. They're not going to be the be-all, end-all day one, guys. No, no. As good as recruits are, they still have growing pains. I watched K 
Caleb Downs today at, at Alabama play a really good game for Alabama, but he also got smoked against Texas to start the season. Mm-hmm. So adjust to expectations. Those guys may end up being great players, but right off the bat, you got to give them some time to develop. Yep. I, CJ, you went out and saw Phil Xavier Phil Simi, Kobe Black, uh, those guys, as well as Jordan Johnson Rebel this week at Under Armour. You're going to, to uh, San Antonio later this week for the All American game as well. I mean, we got to have reasonable expectations about some of these young guys for sure, right? Yeah, I'd say there's a few possession or positions on the football field where you don't want a lot of freshmen, you know, necessarily on the field a lot. It's your offensive line. The quarterback is also in that conversation, and it's in the secondary. Uh, it, it's inexperience. There's a, a different speed to the game. I think what we saw to Malik Muhammad and Derek uh, Williams this year was an example of five stars being five stars because that's one of those things that you don't want those guys in that position very early in their career. Uh, one, if you get beat deep often, it messes with your mentality. Two, you don't have the experience, as I mentioned. And three, it, it's just one of those things where you're just more times than not, not physically ready. And so I, I think while it's encouraging that this DB class is very, very talented, trust me, I just saw three of those guys, you know, light up a practice down in Orlando. It, that's encouraging. But for the, to think that they're going to step in and play massive roles right away, I think you need to tap the brakes there because, again, it it's not a position you want a lot of inexperience at coming into a season where you'll be playing against a team playing for a national t- title right now in week two, and then an SEC schedule to follow up right up right after. Got it. All right, uh, hey guys, uh, this one. Considering their strength as the passing game, what did you see as our defensive strategy to defend it? We talked a little bit about this, but what what did you see? Did we play? Did we try to mix it up, Rod? I think that's what you said earlier. Was there a cohesive strategy, or was it just this guy was really good, and we tried everything we could? We threw the kitchen sink at him. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't nothing worked. I mean, what, what what did you see? Yeah, I saw I saw man coverage. I saw them play snug coverage, which is when you come up to uh, play the play the receiver tight in a kind of tight to line of scrimmage, but you're not playing press man. You're not redirecting them. They played bail coverage. I saw Ryan Watts get beat deep on a post route playing bail coverage. That's when you basically have a running start to defend the deep vertical shots, and he still can uh, he still couldn't maintain the upfield shoulder. Uh, and they caught a deep post right on them. Just a great play. And the ball was on the money. And it was a great execution by them. And so I, I want to get I want to be more complimentary to them um than I am critical of Texas. It would they the throws, I guarantee you on my rewatch, uh, you know, I would probably be even more complimentary of the, the throws, the ball placement, the wide receiver routes, Kaylin DeBoer, and the play designs. Um, some of them were just they were beautiful concepts to keep, keep to get Texas DBs in an ad, disadvantageous situation, you know, when they would basically isolate DBs to put them in a slot position. Uh, you, you see Ryan Watts, there are a couple of plays. He's lined up outside as the outside corner. They motion a player outside of him, turn him into a slot defender. Anybody want to see Ryan Watts play the slot? <laughs> oh, <no. I> don't <laughs> know. <laughs> That's what Taylor DeBoer just turned him into, turned him into a slot defender. That ain't good for a guy who doesn't have great hips at the line of scrimmage. Boom. It was a, it's a simple strategy, but a brilliant one. What's the adjustment by Texas? It's really not an adjustment. You can put a safety over the top of them if you want to, um, but then you're going to make yourself vulnerable elsewhere. Um, they, you know, they, they went simple things like formation in the boundary, right? Texas doesn't travel their nickel. So go watch uh, one of the touchdowns. They go formation in the boundary. They got Jade Barron playing the backside field safety, basically, because they don't travel their nickel to formation of the boundary, where you basically have the numbers advantage in the boundary. And they run a double post, almost a flood concept. And they put, I believe it's Derek Williams and uh, Taft Daddy's down there, but he ends up, I believe, carrying with the wheel route. But they put Derek Williams in a really compromising position and forced the backside safety to be the help on the 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 number what becomes the number three, the deep post route there. They got they had no answer for it. And the ball was on the money. Jade Barron's late getting there. It wasn't bad. The window was still small. In the Big 12, that's a pick. 
against a big 12 quarterback, a pick. And today, Baron is Deion Sanders down the sideline. And we all, you know, everybody's happy and celebrating. Against Washington, it was a touchdown. You see what I'm saying? There are plays. Uh, Ryan Watts, you talked about it, CJ. And you talked about it as well, Bobby, that, that play in the fourth quarter. Um, Ryan Watts um, gives up the deep ball. And he's got decent coverage in the big 12, guys. He knocks that ball away and we're celebrating how great Ryan Watts is against this team, NFL wide receiver, NFL first-round quarterback, sophisticated passing game. It was easy money for him. Over-the-shoulder execution, we keep the ball moving. And we're all sitting, damn, I, how do you do that? Best quarterback they played, most sophisticated passing game they played. Like we kept trying to tell y'all, they only got three advantages, but they are huge: quarterback, head coach, and passing game. And that's how they won. That's football, folks. Absolutely, that's it. Like that's that hey, he, was, hey, Rod, he was just that good. I want to I want to ask, stay on you. Why do our corners all struggle with finding the ball in the air? They don't hurt, turn their heads, and it costs us. Great season, and thanks. OTF, that's from Rocky Poor. They're out of position. They're, they're, they're out, out of position. position. Yeah, go watch. I mean, is there any deep ball where Texas was in good – that Ryan watched when he was in decent position. But where he messed up is once he gets in a – I believe he, that's where he's in the two-way go, he doesn't get a hand on him. I, I want to see him go back to him and watch it. He doesn't touch him. You are Ryan Watts. You don't run. You don't run with receivers well after the line of scrimmage. You need to get your hands on everybody and reroute them, first and foremost. And then you can decide to play coverage downfield. Him just playing, making it a track meet, that's a, that's not a wise decision. That's why he ended up beat. Gave him a free release. He took it. He beat you over the top. I, I, I think a lot of these DBs don't understand their strengths and weaknesses. They don't understand leverage really well either. Um, and you can go watch some of the – one of the other deep balls on um, – man, I believe it's – if I'm not mistaken, it's Terrence Brooks over there on that deep ball – they're playing outside leverage, and I'm not sure they're being told to play outside leverage on some of these concepts when it's clear that they don't have inside help and they're still playing outside leverage. And I don't I don't understand it. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, if I don't have inside help, then I'm always going to be head up to inside leverage. They don't always do that. There are times where they just they play outside leverage. And I'm, I'm assuming they think they're going to get help from the safety. But then number two or number three it runs a route that's away, safety goes away, and then there's no help inside. And I'm thinking, if that's even a possibility, use the sideline as your extra defender. They, they never use the side. They don't even like the sideline. They they not use the side. I was told the sideline is always your extra man. Always use them if you have an option too. And they don't do that. They 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 play a lot of outside leverage, forcing things inside, and then at times there's nobody there. I don't. I mean, it was, it was a problem earlier this year, and it's it was a problem in this game too. Got it, um, Rod. A couple more, and I know CJ, your battery to your uh, computer is dying. Uh, you're telling me via text, so if you drop off, we understand it, CJ. Uh, but please stay with us as you can here. Uh, JS Hooper, PK isn't a big game coach. We saw it against OU multiple times. We got lucky versus Bama at times. We had no answers for wash what Washington was doing. Sometimes you don't have answers, though. <laughs> I mean, no matter who, who the coach is. I don't. I didn't have any. Mm. I CJ, what did you I think? I don't think you can just flip like that. I mean, you, you have a top 15 scoring defense on the season. There's been improvements every season so far under PK. After week two in Alabama, you're sitting there thinking, well, we have a pretty good defensive coordinator. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I, I agree. I, got, I agree. And this what brings up Sean. Why are we assuming the secondary issues are solely a personnel issue? Who has improved in this secondary under these position coaches? Fair? That is fair. I, I don't know. I'll say that the defense overall has improved. Um, I believe they have a certain strategy they want to play on defense. And and then that strategy oftentimes is take away the run, make them one dimensional, force them into throwing the football. And then Texas from then on, you know, they try to solve the problems, make you marshal into the field. They play really good third down defense, half of most of the year. Uh, they're really good red zone defense. Situational defense is what they focus on after they make you one dimensional. Uh, it just so happens they ran into a problem you cannot solve. Guys, it happened against Oklahoma too. 
what is it? What, what do we think it's a coincidence? The best two quarterbacks you played on two games you lost. <laughs> that's football. That's, that's, that's and, exactly and that's your yeah, that's your big weakness defensively. So, and by the way, they took some Oklahoma strategy points. They did. Pen- Penix hadn't run that much. I, no, I mean, right? Zone they read. <laughs> he did the zone read, Rod, and he kept it. Hey, they did. The, hey, we trust me. I watch a lot of Washington. They didn't do that. They they just they broke that out. That was a little Dylan Gabriel special there. Michael Penix, his longest run. How about this? All season long, his longest run was 11 yards coming in tonight's game. And in this game, I think he ran for three for 31 yards. They it was they didn't need it, but I guarantee you, if they had been struggling or in a shootout with Texas, they brought that quarterback run game out. It was gonna break it out. They didn't need it. Like, now we're not get our quarterback hurt for this. This is not this is not make any sense. We still got the game under control. If that game would have been, I would say, out of their control earlier, you'd have saw a more quarterback run game. Guarantee it. He's already that was already one of his best running performances of the season. Yeah, they were using some of the same concepts. Hey, guys, a lot of the same concepts that I've been talking about all season long. We discussed it. Y'all probably tired of me uh, talking about it, and you won't. I'll shut up about him after this. Targets to bunch formation. Right, the they they went empty formation a lot. That's how they got these uh the, the safeties isolated formation of boundary. These are not the when I come up when I go through my my, my rewatch and give you guys all the nuggets. It, it is not just for the hell of it. Like I'm telling you, what other coaches are looking at, they are building game plans off of those concepts. I guarantee you. And when I go back and rewatch it and I go track it, I'm gonna tell you it's gonna be all the same stuff I've been bringing up. Over and over again. Been telling you for weeks, pony package. You know what it works, Sark. You should run more of it. You should run it. It works without Bill's B. John and Rojo. And what happens in the game? It works. Listen, I don't I don't just do it for the hell of doing it, man. I put work into it because it matters, but I do know what the hell I'm talking about. And other coaches do too. They're not taking my notes, they're just looking at the same thing I'm looking at. And so those issues that have plagued Texas all season long came back to haunt them in this game. I told y'all, Texas is not good at defending the deep ball, they weren't all season. What was distorting the sample was those backup quarterbacks. And I told y'all what I do. I took that out of my sample size. And I told you, when you take that out of sample size, they're allowing opposing quarterbacks to complete 42% of their deep balls. And Penix was at 44%. That's a problem. Now, if you put the the, 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 the backup quarterbacks in there, you're at 36%. But I didn't do that because that's not necessarily reality. Texas wasn't going to face a backup quarterback. They're facing the best quarterback in the country, potentially. So let's get to a real sample size. And guys, when you started breaking it down that way, Texas had real issues in the secondary, big issues in the secondary that the Big 12 could not expose because they don't have the quarterbacks to do it. They ain't got the wide receivers to do it. They don't have the offenses to do it. They had one offense that could do it, and they did it. And we we hoped and we prayed that was an outlier. It wasn't. If they they face another offense that good at passing the football, they're going to struggle again because that's where they struggle. That's football. It's okay. They're not perfect. And in this game, that's what this matchup exposed. And they just didn't see that in the Big 12. They didn't see it. And when teams decided to become that in the Big 12, they ran, they moved the ball. U of H, TCU, K-State, they were all moving it. They didn't have great quarterbacks, great wide receiving cores, but they did move the ball. So it, it doesn't surprise me at all. What I'm disappointed in is the Texas offense. I knew the Texas defense was not going to hold up. We kept telling y'all that. There was no, they had no, there was no way it was going to work for them. They just were going to – hopefully, if Byron Murphy and Spandre Sweat took over the game, the disappointment was that Texas offense was supposed to perform at a higher level. They did not. They didn't pull a hold of their end of the bargain. That's on Sark. That's on Sark. All right. Uh, we got a number of Super Chats I want to get to and, and try to run these through. I don't think we're going to be able to answer all of them tonight. Uh, we will definitely be back on uh, coffee and football in the morning. Uh, going to get to a few of them, though, here. Eric, 76, sounds like Texas was a year early and immature in high-pressure game. And they have a head coach that has not been a head coach in a game like this, and the years going forward should be better. I don't know if it was about the head coach. I don't know if they were immature. They just didn't play. They didn't play sharp tonight. I don't know if that's in, immature. Uh, this is from Daryl Stevens. How do we not score with a first and 10 on the 12-ish yard line? With a college football playoff on the line, play calling, maybe play calling 15 mm-hmm. seconds is is a, an issue too. You know you can't throw the ball underneath ever. Hey, right? Didn't it feel like when they added one second back to the clock that we were watching a movie all over again? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit with, uh, with Colt, no doubt. Uh, to Toe Sucker, by the way, Colt was doing the, the, oh, the uh, Watch With Me version uh, as well on ESPN, the Megacast. Uh, Toe Sucker, I get that we don't have the speed in the secondary, but the DBs not turning their heads was concerning. Is that a coaching issue or are certain players just natural at it? Rod's talked about this before. There are different types of players and corners. Yeah. Some are, they play the hands. Some try to play the ball. Some are just trying to box you out, basically. There's a, there's different kinds of corners, and, and that's the ultimate answer, uh, by the way. Uh, Judge the boss, uh, J-Dog the boss, do you think Ewers comes back after this game? Yes, is my answer, and he should. Uh, if he, He's got so much growing up to do. Brandon Rawson, I'm upset about this loss, but dang, man, you can't tell me we're not on an upward trajectory. Uh, we have recruited all our weak spots and we finally know how to develop these kids. I'm happy, man. You should be because you're right about just about all of those things. They are on an upward trajectory. There's no doubt about that. Texas has recruited. Well, this was a good showing. This mm -hmm. wasn't, you got just bombed in a, in a game. You know what I mean? And so I, I don't think we have to worry about that sort of stuff, Rod, uh, as we go forward. Uh, all right. Uh, Justin Wales here. Great meeting you, Bobby, not to continue harping on it, but what's the path forward in the secondary? Just wait for four. Just wait for speedy recruits to grow up. <laughs> uh, well, Makuba's already in. The young man from uh, from Austin mm -hmm. LBJ by way of Clemson. Texas yeah. will look at another safety in the portal. And guys so will get better. Guys, guys will improve. And guy, Jalani McDonald will improve. Derek Williams yeah. will improve. Uh, Michael like Tapp. Muhammad. A lot of guys will still yeah. improve. So, uh, I agree. Uh, all right, here, Lane Seawright. Uh, thank you, Bobby and team, for a great season. Thanks to you, Jerry, Rod, and now CJ. Never, I never felt surprised on game day. Y'all are elite at what you do, and I hope it continues into next year. Lane, okay. thank you, man. That's a very nice thing to say, and we definitely are, are continuing into the new year. Happy New Year to each and every one of you out there. Uh, this is from B-Bar. Normally, catch all after it's ended. Thank you for adding to what was a great season. Here's to better days next season. Here's the, to better days for years to come, D-Bar. I'm right, brother. Yeah, yeah. We see a lot of that sort of stuff as we get into this uh, more and more with Steve Sarkeesian. I, just, I think it's going uh, to happen on a pretty big scale for the Longhorns. All right, uh, Rod, we, we got to get out of here. Got to get going because I know uh, it's been a long night uh, and a long day for both of mm. us. We've been up since the crack of dawn. And we're going to go <laughs> to bed with the vampires in New Orleans tonight. Oh, uh, hey, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your final thoughts on this game and this season for the long run? Um, Man, it's been a great season. Uh, it's been an unbelievable season. They made me a believer. Uh, I was not a believer in terms of them being a championship, national championship contender. I thought they'd win the Big 12, but being a national championship contender, I was not – necessarily thinking that they were going to achieve that this season. That means they're ahead of schedule. Uh, and I heard, a, I saw the person in the chat mention that this team is ahead of schedule. That is a comforting thought. Um, and we've seen them flash at playing to a standard this season. We saw it in the tech game. We saw it in the Oklahoma state game. Didn't see it in the Washington game, but I mean, against Penix, you think you got to give them their props and give them the flowers and Kevin DeBoer is a hell of a coach as well. Um, but, I think that's a step in the right direction, too. I don't know how often under Steve Sarkeesian we've seen this team play to a really high standard, a championship standard. That's the next step for him um, to do that consistently. Um, you know, most of the games, you're not going to do it every game because nobody's no team is perfect. But, you know, mo most of the games and more of the games, you want to see what they did against Oklahoma State and Tech when they get up. Yes, by those 20 something points, then they dominate, put their foot on the throat and force a team to submit. And they, they have that in them. Now it's going to look different because you'll have different personnel, different players in different roles, different leadership uh, roles next season and different leadership styles. But that's the standard that you want this team to get accustomed to. And they didn't play to that standard, but that's okay. Because like I said, ultimately I'm on my rewatch. I'm going to rewatch this game with joy in my heart. Usually I'm rewatching a loss with a lot of, uh, you know, anger <laughs> and frustration. And that won't be the case when I rewatch this game, I'll be rewatching it. Um, with a lot of joy because I know that Sark has done a great job with the program. He's got things headed in the right direction. I'm gonna still be critical. Y'all know who I am. I'm watching. I'm I'm, a, I'm watching it like a player or a coach, man. I'm a, I'm gonna watch it and be critical. 
um, but I also can can have you know perspective that you know what we've seen here is special. This what this culture is special. The football character of this team is special. They they have some very special traits about them. And that's because the coaching staff. They're doing a great job of cultivating that. They're doing a great job of developing that talent. We're going to see another uh, stepping stone for this, this program when the NFL draft comes around. Get really excited about covering those guys because that's going to help shatter the narrative about Texas can't develop talent. No, no, no. They shattered the narrative about competing for championships, and they're going to shatter the narrative about developing talent when they have six, whatever, seven guys drafted, whatever that number is going to be. And of course, on Texas football is going to carry. So I, I just think we're going to uh, uh, we're here at the perfect time on Texas football, building this community with Longhorn fans, trying to do our best to make sure they're well informed. They're the most knowledgeable and most informed fan base in the country. And I think that's the pride that we have in this. And I think it's a great time to do it. because I think Texas football is about to br bring the brand back to prominence, being feared and respected uh, in the college football realm. And whether they compete for championships, I hope that is the case. But times in the SEC and moving forward, I think Texas will be uh, play, 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 playing in a way that makes the, the fan base proud. I, I think I think I can say that and I can be confident when I say that. Good stuff, Rod. I, and I and I think I would echo so many of your sentiments there. Uh, just uh, the, the fact that Texas is where they are today. Uh, it is part of a process that takes a long time. Uh, they've got to get back at it this month and get some more recruits. Uh, maybe it's Alex Foster, a defensive lineman, but they have their first big junior day coming up January 20th. But I mean, look, the, the transfer portal, uh, it closes tomorrow, by the way. So a lot of the guys that we think might be going into the portal, we'll know more probably in the next 24, 48 hours, whether they actually do go in the portal. So yeah. there's, there's an ongoing news cycle here that we need to be aware of. And, and that Texas coaches, frankly, are going to have to be on top of as well. All right, uh, that's going to do it for tonight. The Longhorns lose 37-31 uh, uh, to the Washington Huskies. Uh, it was a tough game. Uh, Washington seemed to control it uh, for most of the third quarter, uh, but the Longhorns made a very dizzying comeback, almost had a chance to win, or did have a chance to win, threw the ball three times to the end zone, or at least two times to the end zone, excuse me, uh, coming up empty. Uh, on, bo on both attempts there. Uh, that, that'll do it for tonight. We'll, have, we'll be back tomorrow morning for coffee and football. Uh, for Rod Babers, I'm Bobby Burton. Thanks to C.J. Vogel uh, for also stepping in. This has been the Post Game Show, brought to you by Yingling the, and Flight Beer, uh, the next generation of light beer, as well as Faust Distributing. Guys, what a hell. I know this is difficult to go into the new year with a loss, uh, but Texas... Texas, to, to Rod's point, Texas reasserted itself. Agreed. In 2023. Mm -hmm. And that's that's saying something, and that's where Texas needs to go next year. You know, I they may not win 10 games next year. They may only win eight, nine, whatever the number is. But the days of Texas being um, completely just a, not what Texas should be, I think those days are done for, for a good a good while right now. Too many, too many yeah. positive things happening right now on the 40 acres. All right, Rod, thank you so much for a great 2023 season. brother. It's good stuff. All right. uh, we'll talk again soon. Rod Babers, Bobby Burton, signing out with a big hook em. Guys, hook em. be proud. Hook them. <laughs>